Bruce. It's uh, Bruce here from the Coasters Club. And I was recently looking at some information from St Mary's Convent School in Greymouth from 1953. Now, I wonder what the class of 1953 really looked like. Well, I've found one lady and I've tracked her down here to Nelson. Gillian, thanks so much for talking to me today. My pleasure. It's, it's just fantastic. Now, in going through your history, your, your family history is fantastic. And as you know, I, I know your grandsons and, and I know your son and, and, and you know, it's a, it's a wonderful family. Where were you born? In Hokit. Oh, I love it. The oh. capital of the coast. And who were your mum and dad? James Kennedy Basler and Kathleen Agnes Basler, Nee Williams. Okay. Mm. Oh, oh, so your mum was a Williams? Yes, but not the Williams, no relation to me. My mother was a Williams to a Basler. Yes. And I was a Basler back to a Williams, and no relation. Oh, it was meant to be. Yeah. It was meant to be. Yeah. Where, where was your first home? In, well, when I was a child, yeah, in Hokitika. And where about in Hoki? Can you remember? Wherever they had the um, the uh, government homes, somewhere up there, at Searle Street. Yeah, there. okay. Yeah, I think. Right. Yeah, from memory. Remember, I'm nearly 80. I, no, no, no. <laughs> look, you don't look it, I've got to tell you. Good. Now, tell me, when you are when you're a child, what did you do? What did people do when they were children? 75 years ago. Okay, well, I lived in Hokitaroni till I was two, yes. moved to the big city of Greymouth, <laughs> and what did we do? When we were children, we played rounders in the streets, we made our own fun, we cut out pictures of the royal family and put them in scrapbooks and um, played a bit of netball and that at school, and yeah, we just... Um, and then when the movies came in, well, we got, I got, used to get sixpence a week and paid threepence a week to go to the movies. So, um, yeah, we had a great childhood. We didn't have much, but we had a lot of love in our family. It's so that was and, important. And haven't things changed? Now it's um, iPads and oh, yes. cell phones. I not only have grandchildren, I have 13 great-grandchildren. Oh. So I know, <laughs> I know just what <laughs> they do, get today. And Gillian, do you... Did you meet your grandparents? Oh yes, um, on Dad's side, they lived in Christchurch, and my grandmother on my mother's side. I do, do you ever remember anything they said? Oh yes, quite a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, my grand on my father's side, my grandfather was uh, Northern Irish, and my father, of course, from Northern Ireland and he, originally his parents, and he married an Irish Catholic, so things weren't very good Ooh, between, bit, between uh, um, that happening. But anyway, and my grandmother was just a darling. Um, she was widowed when she was about 25 and left with three children, one being my mother, three weeks, and my maternal grandfather was crushed on the Greymouth Wharf between two railway carriages. And they managed to get him home across the Blake Town Bridge, however, I don't know. And he wanted to nurse the baby, which is my mother, and she died in his arms. Oh. Oh. So my grandfather was part Maori, my maternal grandfather. And um, my grandmother married him in Wellington in a registry office, which was unheard of in those days because she was a very devout Catholic. So I found all this out after she died. But um, she didn't have a home to live in, so her sister gave her an old home to live in where she brought up the three children. And she used to walk over the swing bridge, which was there at the time in, in Blake Town, and went to mass every day and then cleaned. Um, she was a cleaner at the Dennehy House which they were quite wealthy people in Greymouth in those days yeah. and the borough council chambers had built where the Dennehy house was. Oh, on the corner there? On the corner. So the Irish uh, Catholic background could, I wonder if that um, uh, explains the determination of the family. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably does. It, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Now where did, where did you go to primary school? Oh, at the convent and it was called a Montessori in those days. Right. And 
you had to pay to attend it in those days, but we were quite poor and somehow we didn't pay. They allowed me to, and my sister and brother, well no, my brother went to the Maris, so he was younger. I think a lot of us that uh, didn't have a lot were, were... We had nothing. We had the support though. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah. yeah now, we had a great life. What about high school? High school was at St Mary's in Greymouth. That's well, yeah. Yeah, and um, I had to leave when I was 14 because um, I wasn't very clever at school. What, what on earth happened then? Because we know that's not true these days. <laughs> determination when I was told I would never make a go alive when I was 14. Oh, that's in front of me. Oh, I love it. So I went up to the, do you want me? Yes, please, yeah. Up to the Greymouth Hospital and um, I was 14 and I told a white lie and told them I was 15. And um, at that stage they had three nurse aides. So instead of being a maid that I thought I was going to, I became a nurse aide and quite frankly it could have been very dangerous because there wasn't much training Right. and uh, I remember mainly working in the Saltzman ward at Grey Hospital which was a TB ward at the time and we used to give 17 injections a day and how it old was were you? quite busy and how old were you? 14 and a half going on 15 <laughs> oh, I love it yeah so um, I enjoyed um, yeah and um, I was sort of Older than my age because I got thrown into things at the hospital. I did night duty yep. without being fully trained. We had a certain amount of training, but not like full training. Julian, did, did you have a um, did you have a favourite subject at school? Was there something that you you remember where you went? Actually, I, I quite like that. Um, probably typing. I enjoyed typing. Um, I would have loved to have learnt the piano and all that, but we had no money. Um, what about, uh, do you remember a teacher? Oh yes, we had some lovely teachers, yes. Any, any in one fact, that... one of them is still alive in Nazareth House, would you believe, who I visit occasionally. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, and um, she's still got a wits about her. Yeah, so actually I meet up with, um, there's still 10 of my classmates alive in Greymouth, and eight in Christchurch, which is amazing, and um, we meet up in Christchurch occasionally. So, yeah. did you play sports? Yes, I played netball. Oh, well, no, in those days it was called basketball, but right. I played netball. Um, that's about all I played in those days. And I suppose you were one of those girls in the Greymouth team that us and Buller couldn't beat? Oh, well, I represented West Coast oh, at good. netball in the younger days. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, tell me, if you had a close friend, how would she or he just would have how would they have described you as a young adult? Yeah, were you? Um, well, I don't know. I was sort of mature for my age, probably a bore if anything. Naive but mature. Um, a bit conservative maybe? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe shy. Shy would be the word. And so we've heard about your, your first job, which was at uh, uh, at the hospital. Where did it go from there? Well, I left the hospital to nurse a sick mother at home for nine months. In the meantime, I met my lovely husband at a dance at Gladstone in those days. And he was Graham um, and uh, from Hokitika. And uh, yeah, Graham had, a not, had borrowed an old truck from a friend, Ron Lindsay, and they'd come up for the dance. And I met Graham and of course I'd gone to the dance on a bus. So Graham took me home to Blake Town in Ron's truck, little runabout, not a truck, runabout. And um, I was so ashamed of our old house. See, I was getting to that age because it was tumbled down and old. And um, so I got Graham to drop me off at the flash house three doors there. And, and, um, but anyway, we did have a party line. We could afford a telephone party line in those days. Graham rang my mother to take me out and I'm waiting patiently for Graham and um, mum was kind of not well but dad they agreed that I could go out and uh, here's Graham parked three doors down at the flash oh, house. the wrong house. So I had to go down and tell him <laughs> so that was a bit embarrassing. Anyway. So Julian, so, what, was, what was your first date with Graham? Can you remember the first date? The, the, first, first, the first real date? You know, yeah, the, it was the date he came to pick me up at the In the house. truck? Yeah, oh, I didn't like have many books, and the runabout, yeah. And um, Mum loved Graham, and um, so to, while I nursed Mum at home, 
Graham and I got engaged to please Mum. And then she died in my arms and um, Graham said to me, well, we might as well get married. And in those days we got married. So how long did you know Graham before you married him? Um, it was a long time, a short no, time? a short time. Must have been right then. It was. Very right. And a wonderful so, man. I was yeah, very fortunate. I was lucky enough to know him. Yeah. Um, now, now how, many, uh, how many children did you have? Three children. We moved to um, Reefton with an old truck. Graham bought an old Ford truck. And we moved to Reefton where Graham worked on the Rahu Saddle. And, um, and then we had Tony, my eldest son, was born in Reefton. And um, then we moved back to Greymouth. We saved money, saved really hard. We rented a house for 10 shillings a week in those days in Reefton. And um, we bought another two trucks, a comma, old comma and bedroom truck and a loader from a chap called Edgar Brown contracting. Right. And um, we struggled because the bank wouldn't give us a loan in those days. So we really struggled and I remember I had two more children and um, we couldn't eat meat because we couldn't afford meat and when we did, could afford meat, Graham and I, I fed them on every way you could do a sausage. <laughs> now the three of them in their fifties or nearly sixty one of them won't look at a sausage. Um, and I got my heavy traffic licence um, when I was 18 and I was one of the first women on the, in Greymouth, well I was the first woman in Greymouth, didn't I? heavy traffic license. So between Graham and I doing the heavy work, I drove trucks and um, then I worked at the laundry to get some money to buy the tire for the truck. They were always broken down these old on them bed the truck. <laughs> and um, so we just worked extremely hard. I had another, I took in sewing to, make, to buy another tire for the truck, sewing at four in the morning and then off to the laundry and then drove trucks with three kids sitting on the seat of a truck with no seat belts, could have brought two of them all, but in those days trucks didn't go very fast. So we've had an interesting career and then um, our opportunities, we uh, bought a crushing plant. Now the crushing plant really interests me because my grandfather had the house in front of the crushing plant. And we, and we in bought, Blaketown. Yeah, well we bought the North Beach crushing plant from a group of people and one of them was Doug Truman that was a director of the North Beach crushing plant. Right. But we moved it to Blaketown. Well, yes, we shifted it to Blaketown, worked off the Blaketown beach. But in those days you had to have licenses and everything for trucks and loaders and yeah, do you know them. that do you remember the bamboo along the side? Yes. yes. Well I set fire as a youngster, um, I was staying at my Jack grandfather's Jack. place and I set fire to it. And I remember Graham chasing me through the fence across the garden, and I don't know whether he let me escape or whether I just escaped, but I, I never take matches near bamboo again. I bet you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now tell me, you know, you've in eighty years, what are the most important inventions you've seen? What are the changes that you've seen? Oh, good lord! Well, technology number one. Yes, it would be the biggest. <laughs> Um, oh, it changes trucks. Well, we landed up getting, you know, after we could get a loan building up and we got better trucks. That was a big improvement. Changes? Oh, so many changes in life. Do you remember the, when TV first came out? Oh, yes, did we ever. We did, couldn't afford one for a while, but we did have an aerial up. Right. <laughs> and then when we got our first TV, we watched the Beverly Hillbillies through snow. That was. And was that coming straight see. out of Australia or somewhere? Remember? I don't know, I can't recall. No. Sorry, I can't recall. I do believe it may have, and um, yeah, when I look back on that, and uh, yeah. Now tell me. That was the big thing. In when, when you look back through your life, was there somebody that you met or came across, apart from Graham, because Graham was the love of your life, but was there someone who, who changed the way you thought about things? Was My grandmother. My grandmother was a very, very, oh, I just loved her to bits, and very positive little lady, and and she was my inspiration in life. Changed us? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> We've got to keep, try to remember. Um, no, Graham and my grandmother were my inspiration. I can understand that. Is there anything that you really wanted to do that you didn't do? 
And you've still got plenty of time, but I mean, you know. No, so. I've, I've, had a, I've had a very lucky life because every opportunity that came along I grabbed. And I landed up working in the court system voluntary for many years because one of our drivers had to appear in court and his mother had died. And I went with him and um, the lawyers pounced on me to fill out um, documents for the... There was amazing the number of people, youth and young adults that couldn't read or write in those days. Wow. And then the, I got rang up to see if I'd start friends that caught it Greymouth voluntary and then that led to the judges used to come over from Christchurch and it led to I got to know them so they'd call me into chambers to tell tell them what should be done with a certain person more than um, <laughs> what the lawyers said I got the respect of the visiting judges and then that turned to one chap came from Hoka Ticket that had to appear at court and he was sentenced to prison and he couldn't go home to clean out his house. So, and he had driven up in an old truck, so it caused me with the heavy traffic license. But I did ring Graham and Graham followed us down. Oh, Graham drove his truck down. I cleaned out his fridge. Then I would visit him in prison. And then, because the prison was in Christchurch, and then when he came out, I met the bus and found him some employment and somewhere to live. And um, from then on, and I was field office for prisoners aid and rehabilitation. So I've been in prison more times than you'd want to know, <laughs> visiting people. Of, of course, now, now tell me, Gillian, um, one of the biggest moves that I saw as a young man was a King's Hotel going into receivership, and then the Williams family, uh, you and Graham, yeah. uh, buying it. Yeah. Was, was that a nerve wracking investment? Oh. Course, but we'd been positive all our lives, and um, so um, we're actually out with our account. And they said, I've got a good business for you. And we went along and had a look. And the old the plants have been through twice, smelt of silt. But the old sideboard that was a real feature in King's Hotel won me over. So we purchased it, and um, yeah, we had no clients for a long time, and um, yeah. And is that where Tony um, started his... Yes, Tony, we built it up. Um, Graham and Tony, I can still see them today in their overalls, working their hearts out. We did it up and it got too big for me to manage. I was there managing it first. So Tony left the crushing plant, Graham managed the crushing plant and Tony came up and helped me manage King's Hotel. Wow. And it was a, quite a success story after a while. Do, do you remember when it won the uh, New Zealand Tourism Award? Mm, 1994. Which that was, was really... through all the papers. And we, we, oh, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, no, that was um, quite an accolade. Not for just King's Hotel, but for Greymouth. It was wonderful for Greymouth. It put Greymouth on the map and um, because we're on, on the television on the aircraft that went to Aussie. And, yeah. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful thing. And then in uh, 96, of course, uh, Millennium Group took it over. Yeah, we sold to the Millennium Group. Now tell me, um, uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, maybe... A, and Tony, my son, then um, we owned the Christian plant and then Graham passed away, mm. unfortunately, in 96. So Tony ran the crushing plant for quite a while and then decided he'd like to get back into hotels. So he's, he's been extremely successful. With oh, it's, he's, just, he's just built for it. Mm. It's, it's mm. just totally yeah. young. Yeah. Now tell me, um, Cave Creek. Yeah. I remember sitting on the desk, uh, in my uh, sitting on my desk in my office, and it came over the news that Cave Creek, the Cave Creek platform, had collapsed. And my mother had rung me the night before and told me that her and the older and bolder group had been up there, and there was twenty of them on the platform, and they were looking. And she's telling me how wonderful it was but how far down it was. And I thought, if it's collapsed, bad things are going to happen. The, the, the people will have died. Now, in 1995, you were appointed to the Commission of Inquiry. Yeah, that would lead mainly because of my court, voluntary court work, because I was still, even though we own the hotel, still helping people, or I'd visit people in prison. And, um, 
Yeah, so that led to me being appointed to the Cape Creek Inquiry and I was, did it, I was mainly the registrar and also because of I love people, I went with the families down to the where the flats had been while they sorted out their socks and, you know, looked at things. Oh. And I was able to because I had a great love of people. It was a gift I was given um, to be able to give them a cuddle and whatnot, as well as be doing a professional job on the inquiry with yeah. Judge Noble. Mm. Uh, Julian, when you, when you went down to the site, I've been in there several times, it feels... Um, spiritual or something. Yeah, it is very much. I've been back since, Bruce, and it's very much. So after the, after the Cave Creek inquiry, which, um, which must have been pretty thought-provoking, that was in 1995, wasn't it? It was. Um, you were then appointed to the uh, Conservation Board? Yes, that mainly led, led from the Cave Creek inquiry, because as you know, the Conservation Board were the well, they got charged, didn't they? And the, 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 no, the different no, charge. The minister resigned. Yes. The minister resigned, and there's a few people. Yeah, there. and yeah. Um, I got rung up from somebody in Hokitika to see if I'd go on the board, and I said, quite frankly said no. I don't. I'm not into conservation. Yeah. And then um, Graham passed away, and they rang me again. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to get on there for the because of the coast. I was dead against the. Free furling, Some of the things that are good. So that was a very, once again, no education, very interesting experience because probably the second meeting I was asked by a very clever man on the board if I would ask the question because if they did, they'd look stupid. So I don't know what that made me, but I asked the question. Anyway, um, I was appointed by a national government and Helen Clark at that stage was, her and Eugenie Sage were coming down to the coast and I met Helen Clark a few times through the Conservation Board right. and I was dead against them stopping the native logging and I told her so and why and because, you know, it's part of our livelihood of the coast, etc, etc. So when Helen Clark came into power, that's normally when all the board got dismissed because it was a political appointment. Yes, it was, yeah. But lo and behold, if Helen Clark didn't reappoint me, and it was quite an accolade, really, and I think she respected my views. And, um, yeah, and I got on, when she came down, I got on quite fine, but I never changed my mind, well, unfortunately. I guess, I guess Gillian, she... Um there are very few people who are such straight shooters in life. Yeah. And and it's, you know, I can, I can understand. Actually, I have great respect for her in lots of ways. But yeah. um, anyway, as you know, the story, and from there, after, I don't know whether I was still on the Conservation Board or not, but the Development West Coast rang me up, or somebody contacted me, to stand for the board. And yeah. that was the money that had come from the native blogging, as you know, Bruce. Yeah. So it was in uh, 2001. Oh, God, we'll see. I can't remember the years. And uh, what happened there was um, I stood and um, I remember going to Gloravale where we had to all speak at, um, we thought we were all speaking at, at Gloravale. They put on a beautiful dinner at night for us. And when I went to get up to speak, I was the only woman, and they wouldn't let me to speak. And afterwards, I had a chat and asked the man in charge, I won't name, why I wasn't allowed to speak. And he said, well, you won't get our vote because I'm a woman. Which was really, I thought, so when we vote, when the voting papers went out and da-de-da-de-da, -da -da, I actually topped the poll. Without their vote. Without their vote. And they're very powerful. So I was on the, the development board for a, a while, but I left there. I, I can't recall the reason. I don't know how many years I was on that. And um, yeah, so that was an interesting experience. It would have been early on. Yeah. And um, of course, you were awarded in 2006, you were awarded a uh, QSM. 
for all of the good work you've done, the public work and, and the community work? Well, I turned it down. It was offered to me in 2005 and I turned it down because, quite frankly, I don't believe in them all. And uh, I moved to Nelson at that stage. I was in Nelson in 2006 when they rang again from Wellington and, and they said, well, you know, if you don't want it for yourself, why don't you take it for the, the give, like, prisoner's aid and that a little bit of kudos? And, and we won't be offering it to you again. So I, they gave me, I said, well, give me a couple of hours to think about it. So I came off the phone and I talked to a friend. And the friend said, now, what would Graham have said? And I thought, well, I don't know. I know what Graham would have said. And so I thought, well, mainly about prisoners' aid and that, that kind of thing. So I rang them back and accepted it. Well, they rang me back one of the two. Yeah. yeah. So that was a lovely experience. Oh, I think, I think but, that's... But, I mean, it wasn't for me only. It was... I, I had help all the way through all my career, you know, careers, all my, yeah. But of course, it was a, for the coast mainly, and for the other people that I worked with. And there's a reality, and that is that that someone is the leader, and everybody helps the leader, yeah. and a lot of people um, clearly helped you, respected you, and and so they they all felt when you received the QSM that they were part of it. It was, very proud. it was a very so. proud time. I hope so. It was a proud time for the family, I think, too. So now you're living in Nelson, yeah. three children, 10 grandchildren, 13 great-grandchildren. Yeah. You're nearly 80 years old. You're in fantastic condition. Oh, yeah. I look it, but I'm not. Well, <laughs> that's all right. I think, I think it's fantastic. That's that wrong way to say I look it. I might look it, but I'm, yeah. And, and look... Uh, I do voluntary work up here, so I'm involved with quite a few things. That doesn't surprise me yeah, in the least. which I love too, yeah. So I Gillian, get more out of it than I go. So Gillian, on, on, on behalf of... We have 21,000 coasters who are members of the Coasters mm -hmm. Club and, and our videos mm -hmm. are watched up to 175,000 times a week. And they're mostly people mm -hmm. like yourself who are away but have this wonderful, strong connection to the coast. And I really want to thank you for taking the time to speak to me and, and sharing your story with uh, all of us. Thank you, Bruce, and for your time. But once a coaster, always a coaster. Remember that. Oh, there we go, folks. We'll cut out on that. <laughs>